You're listening to the SSPX Podcast, and welcome to episode 17 in our sacrament series and our first of two episodes on the Sacrament of Holy Orders. Father John McFarland is joining us today to first look at the traditional rite of Holy Orders. We're going to see the history, what is necessary, that is, the form and the matter of Holy Orders, and then we'll go through the entire ceremony. As we've seen with the other sacraments, this sacrament could easily be performed in just a minute or two. But the ceremony of ordinations to the priesthood is full of rich symbolism, teaching, opportunities for grace, and a beauty that is unparalleled. We'll show you sections of the ceremonies from this past June at St. Thomas Aquinas Seminary as well, so you can follow along as we're speaking about them. If you like these series and want to help us continue to make them, you can help by leaving a small monthly or one-time donation on sspxpodcast.com, or by subscribing to this channel on YouTube, or by subscribing and leaving a rating for the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. And thank you for helping us with this apostolate to reach as many people as possible with the beauty and the truth of what it means to be a traditional Catholic. Now, let's join Father McFarland for episode 17 of the Sacrament Series right now. Father McFarland, welcome back to the SSPX Podcast and the Sacrament Series. How are you doing at the beginning of the summer or this summer? Oh, swinging on the star. How about you? (laughs) Doing great. Thank you. Uh, That is fantastic. Um, Wanted to talk with you about something that we mentioned a little bit in the Crisis series, you and I, Father. Um, Mm. That was episode number 39 of the Crisis series, almost a year ago now. Um, When we talked about our our Novus Ordo priests and bishops validly ordained. So just a heads up, we're going to be talking about probably some of the same sort of things uh, during these next two episodes, but we're going to be talking about this is the most long-winded introduction ever uh, about holy orders, the sacrament of holy orders. Um, so, in this first episode, Father, can you give us kind of a preview of what we're going to be talking about? Uh, we'll talk about the the traditional rite uh, of ordination, the the ordination of uh, of priests in particular. Uh, of course, there are there are other orders, but in the interests of time, and, and that, of course, being the, the, the focal point of the, the Sacrament of, of Holy Orders, uh, we'll, we'll stick with speaking about that. Okay. So I guess we can start with, what does it mean, Holy Orders? I guess I've never really thought about that. It's just always been something that has been called. What, what does that mean? Right. Uh, so order um, signifies the particular rank, the, the status of the, the member of the clergy. Uh, you know, one has the, the order of porter lector or one has the order of, of um, acolyte one has the order of, of deacon one has the order of priest um, also we use it to refer holy orders to refer to the ceremony which raises the the uh, the cleric to that particular uh, degree so uh, being ordained receiving uh, the order of of um, porter we say um, we call that uh, a holy order Okay, and of course, these you have these different grades within the the clergy, and it goes back to to ancient times. Um, I think the the uh, seven that we're familiar with in the traditional right, uh, eight if you count bishop. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but they, I believe, it's the third century. We already have a, a list of of all of those orders being used in the Latin church. You do have some differences, uh, in other rites, um, in other places. So, uh, the various importance given to, to the particular orders. So being a, a subdeacon it, traditionally in the, in the Latin rite puts you in major orders in the Eastern church, or at least in parts of the Eastern church, it was considered a minor order and, and so on. Okay. So when we're talking about the holy orders as being a sacrament, at what point does it become a sacrament? Is it just at the ordination to the priesthood? Uh, so you've had varying opinions of this. There's there's a lot of I'll preface this by saying there are, there's a lot of variation um, in what the theologians have thought over the centuries in regard to the sacrament of holy orders, uh, and some of it has been um, clarified or at least potentially clarified by historical research in the last couple of centuries that was not available, say in the uh, 13th, 14th century. And um, so what was your question? (laughs) At at what point is it a sacrament? Is it a sacrament? Uh, Deacon. So the, so the, the, the diaconate, the priesthood and the episcopacy are all certainly of, 
of divine institution. It, the the other orders are of ecclesiastical institution. So the, the the church has, so to speak, broken up the the various duties that that could belong to a, to a deacon and given to them to members of the clergy gradually. So they're building up to the responsibilities, uh, building up to the the actual reception of the sacrament uh, of holy orders. So, and that it's it's unique in that case too. It's it's one sacrament of holy orders that you receive in in parts sure. and and the the beginning parts are generally believed not even to actually be a part of the sacrament but kind of a preparation for the sacrament certainly if you receive the diaconate or the priesthood you would receive the the powers of all of those those minor orders okay uh I, you mentioned this i think when we were talking about this in the crisis series don tranquilo did also uh, talking about how the episcopacy again according to some theologians i believe that is kind of considered to be receiving the fullness of the priesthood because our Lord didn't necessarily say there should be priests and there should be bishops that that didn't happen. Right. And the, and the historical um, evolution of that is, is pretty murky. So there, there, both words are used early on in the, in the history of the church um, uh, priest um, presbyter and um, Bishop Episcopus uh, are um, sometimes used synonymously, sometimes with with uh, with evident distinctions. So it's not entirely clear what's going on there. Uh, so you have those theologians who say, no, they're just the priesthood is is the pinnacle. Um, really, they're just certain powers that are that are bound, if you will, until they receive the uh, episcopal consecration. And you have other theologians who will say, no, it's it's a it is a distinct order. It's part of the sacrament, uh, and that. Controversy is not entirely resolved, although the, the common opinion um, more recently, even before the council, was seemed to be tending in the direction uh, that the episcopacy is is uh, sacramental. Okay, so we have in the we have in these stages that we that you talked about in the traditional um, formation of the priesthood, it's porter, lector, exorcist, etc. Um, do those all still exist in the, the new rite of the sacrament? No. So all the minor orders uh, have been suppressed as orders of the clergy. Uh, you do still have something for, for lector and uh, an acolyte, um, a kind of blessing that's given to lay people that are uh, fulfilling those functions, but not as degrees within the, the ranks of the clergy working up to, uh, to the priesthood. And uh, the subdiaconate, likewise, uh, no longer exists in, in the modern church. Okay. So thousands of a thousand plus years of, of church history just done away with the stroke. But that's sure. a, that's a conversation for the next episode. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> um, so I guess let's get into, uh, unless there's anything else I missed kind of in your introduction, father, um, let's get into the ceremony itself, the sacrament itself. Uh, where does it, where does it begin? So, of course, so the beginning of the uh, of of the church, you have ceremonies that um, by which these orders are are conferred upon uh, the candidates. We we find the apostles uh, laying hands upon those that they're um, sending to preach and those that are going to to succeed them as as the leaders of the churches in various places, um, and. You know that again develops very differently depending on which part of the church we're talking about, which rites, which countries, which which languages, which which apostles um, evangelized those regions, and uh, and so on. So it's um, again there's a lot of variation between the the east and the west, uh, but always you do have these these ceremonies, um, and what we have in the in the Latin church has d- developed a lot. Um, over the centuries, there were quite a few things added uh, in the Middle Ages, in particular, I think, to to s- kind of draw out the all the various different functions and dignities of the priest. Okay. And so this this uh, you, and you have in in every rite, you know, two common and, and universal elements, and that is the imposition of hands. So the the ordinand has 
uh, presents himself to the bishop and the bishop imposes his hands upon the, the ordinand. Um, and there's some prayer joined to that that expresses what this imposition of hands is, the conferring of the sacrament of holy orders. Okay. So we don't have a specific formula like we do for baptism. Um, this was not given by our Lord himself like, no. like baptism was. It, it is the imposition of hands and some sort of prayer signifying what is happening. Right. And we have, you know, it's, it's the... Uh, you know, the, the teaching of the church that our Lord institutes holy orders uh, at the last supper, right? When he commissions his, his apostles to do this, to continue what he's done as a commemoration of him, but we have no record of him imposing hands. So is that specifically ordered by, by our Lord? Uh, we don't know exactly. Certainly the apostles are already doing it. So mm-hmm. It's an, it's an apostolic tradition at the very least. Um, and again, it is, it is universal. The words, we really have uh, the possibility for tremendous variation depending on what the, the church uh, decides to impose and has imposed in, in, uh, in the various rites. Okay. So the ceremony itself takes place during Mass always, right? Right. Um, and so you have the, the candidates who are already deacons as they've already been been ordained deacon uh, candidates for the priesthood. They present themselves uh, mostly dressed for the, the celebration of mass. So they wear the, the amice over their shoulders, the, the white alb, the, the ankle length uh, white garment, the, the cincture, the rope around their waist, uh, maniple hanging from their, their, uh, their left arm. And then the stole, which they, at the beginning of the ceremony, they're wearing as a deacon wears it, which is over his left shoulder and then joined somewhere at about the hip um, on the right side. So just on, on one shoulder. Okay. Okay. Each one holding a, a lit candle in his hand and they have their priestly vestments. So the chasuble is draped over the, the usually the left arm. Um, and the mass begins... Uh, as a normal uh, pontifical mass with the uh, um, chant of the the introit prayers, the foot of the altar, etc., up until the the end of the intermediate chant between the epistle and the gospel. So, whether depending on the season, gradual and alleluia, gradual and tract, um, the double alleluia during Paschal Tide. Uh, so, after that, the um, the ordination to the priesthood takes place. And this is where we have, at this moment, this is the calling. And I think yep. you and I talked about this on a podcast maybe two, maybe three years ago, that this is actually the calling, the vocation. Right. So in, the, in, the, in the strictest sense, the vocation takes place here. So it, it, there are obviously lots of things, graces and, and um, the circumstances of one's life, the preparation of the seminary leading up to this moment. But in, in its strictest possible sense, here is the vocation, the church actually calling the candidate uh, to ordination. So you have the the the, the priest who's, who's functioning as the, we say the assistant priest or the, the archdeacon who's assisting the bishop throughout the mass. Um, so he reads out this, uh, the, the summons that these are the, uh, the candidates for ordination to the priesthood. And then he calls each of those candidates by his name, by his, the, the diocese where his family resides and, uh, his, his title. So the title for the, the, the priest's maintenance and support. Um, so it's a title to some ecclesiastical revenue, uh, at least it was in former times, or it can be a title of poverty for those who have the religious vows or uh, in the society of St. Pius X or similar societies of common life without vows, we're ordained a titulum mense communis. So to the, the title of the common table, that is that the, the society looks after our, our maintenance and make sure that we don't starve to death. Cormac McCallison for the Assessor of Orlando, Florida, titulum mense communis. Interesting. So, for example, at my ordination, um, the the assistant priest reads out John Mark McFarland, Ellicott City, Archdiocese of Baltimore, Maryland, a titulum mense communis. And then I answer, ad sum, I am here. 
and each of the the, the ordinance uh, does so as his name is called, assuming that he wants to continue to ordination. But if you're making the decision at that point, <laughs> there's 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 a problem. Right. <laughs> Right. So, you got you got six years or more to, right. to kind of figure this out. So yeah, right. Uh, longer than most engagements. So <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. So then then we have the bishop who will ask the archdeacon something at this point. So he asks him if the if the candidates are worthy, and okay. you know, relatively speaking, no one you know, because no one has ever fully worthy of receiving the priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But you know, the candidates having been examined, having spent this time, these years at the seminary, having completed their studies, being known for uh, living a reasonably virtuous life and having good habits of piety and, and uh, you know, not presenting any scandals, etc., are they um, able to be, to be ordained? And the, the archdeacon responds, uh, as far as human frailty allows, I know and testify that they are worthy of the charge of this office. And, uh, and for us, the, in our ordination ceremonies, usually the, the role of, of archdeacon or assistant priest is, is filled by the, the seminary rector, who more than anyone else, in fact, knows the, the, the qualifications of the candidate uh, for the, uh, to be ordained to the priesthood. So he's the one who's actually has has the final say if someone is ordained. So he's he more than anyone else has that that capacity to to uh, to vouch for the worthiness of the candidates. Okay. And then there's uh, then there's another kind of stopgap in the ceremony, I guess, uh, uh, some sort of a safety mechanism. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but mm -hmm. uh, I remember the first ordinations I went to as an adult and was following along. I think it was actually your ordination, Father. Uh, I read this and went. Oh, this is just kind of like the bands of marriage. Same sort of thing happens here. Right. So uh, the bishop is, is consulting the people. He says, lest one or a few be mistaken in their judgment or deceived by affection, we must hear the opinion of many. And then he asks that anyone who knows of anything against when the ordinance is admonished to come forward. And so that would be knowledge of a canonical impediment. So if someone in the congregation knew that one of the ordinance was already married or, or the like, uh, to something along, you know, along those lines. Usually it's where this is at one time in the history of the church, it was a real thing, you know, the, the, right. okay. One, one last check. Anybody know anything? Uh, at this point, it's a formality because of the, the seminary system where you have this extended period of time where the, the candidate is, is being examined, which, which really comes in after the council of Trent. Uh, so prior to that, this examination would have been, been a more important thing, but it, it, it does remain, um, as a, certainly a reminder of the, uh, of the necessity of having, um, candidates who are, who are worthy, whose lives are not scandalous, uh, et cetera. And I mean, I suppose it's also still theoretically possible that something could happen at an ordination ceremony. I've never seen it. Uh, never even heard, heard of it taking place. Uh, but you know, everything happens at some point. At some point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's when you uh, talk to your guests who are coming. Don't, don't do it. Don't stand up. <laughs> Not funny. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, what happens next father? So then there's kind of long instructions, uh, from the bishop to the candidates on the duties of their new office, uh, which are really quite beautiful. Uh, talking about, you know, looking at salvation history and making reference to the Old Testament and so on. We, we can't go into those in, in tremendous detail or we'd, we'd spend an awful uh, lot of time on it. But, um, but some selections from it. He says, the, the office of the priest is to offer sacrifice, to, to bless, to govern, to preach, and to baptize. Truly, it must be with great fear that you ascend to so high a station, and care must be taken that heavenly wisdom and irreproachable character and long-continued righteousness shall commend the candidates chosen for him. Therefore, dearly beloved sons, chosen by our brethren to be our helpers in the ministry, maintain in your deportment inviolate purity and holiness of life. Understand what you do, imitate what you administer. Inasmuch as you celebrate the mystery of the death of the Lord, you should endeavor to mortify in your members all sin and concupiscence. And so, you know, the trying to raise the mind of the, of the candidate to the, um, the importance, the dignity of his station to, to strive always to be making himself worthy of this, this great thing that he does. And that, that 
sentence, especially, you know, it's one of those things that, that turns up on priest retreats all the time and, and uh, in books of priestly spirituality, understand what you do, imitate what you administer, right? Rem- remember that you are offering in, in the very person of our Lord Jesus Christ, his sacrifice. And what you're administering is the, his, his body and blood that you are um, handling these things, coming into contact with these tremendous realities uh, on a daily basis. And that, that should be for you a, uh, a spur to striving after holiness, mortifying sin and concupiscence uh, in your, in your soul. And then afterwards we have the, the litany of the saints. And this is always done at, at these solemn occasions. It's done at, at Easter time. It's done during these, these larger ceremonies. And it's, like, what's the purpose here? So in, invoking all of the, the heavenly court to the, the assistance uh, um, here of the, of the ordinance, right? praying for their, their sanctification, their, their worthy um, fulfilling of their office. Here it's if, if you have ordinations to another major order taking place before those to the priesthood. So if the subdeacons or deacons have been ordained, the, the litany of the saints will take place earlier before those ceremonies. Um, but if they don't, it takes place at this point in the, in the ordination uh, of priests. And it's, a um, it's, a uh, it's a very striking um, moment in, in the ceremony because the, all of the candidates for major orders will, will prostrate themselves so they'll be they'll be lying face down with their head like this and their face to the ground um, in the in the middle of the sanctuary. So so lying flat uh, and um, in in that assuming that that posture of humility um, during this time of, of this begging for the the intercession of the uh, of the saints of all the heavenly court. And again, we we just um, you know we we just published as of the time of the recording this we just published the the episode on extreme unction where calling all of the saints of heaven down to you know stand before the person who's dying and and the devil you know same sort of thing here just begging all of heaven to come down and, and be a part of this ceremony it's it's striking and beautiful right yeah. you know? um and then we have uh the imposition of hands and that is actually the matter of the sacrament is that right that's right okay so each each of the ordinance will come up um before the bishop who's uh standing before the altar and the bishop will put both hands on the head uh, of the, of the ordinand. Okay, so that, that is, is the matter. And then usually the way it works is they'll, they'll come down from, from the altar and then line up and each priest present at the, at the ordination ceremony will then take his turn uh, imposing his hands upon the, the head of uh, of all of the ordinance. And it's a sign of the unity of the, uh, of the priesthood that the priests themselves are not, not ordaining, but joining themselves to this, this act of the, uh, of the Bishop in, um, swelling their ranks. Sure. I was going to ask if it was a matter of sort of sharing power, so to speak, or if it was a matter of unity and, and it's that. It's the yes. Yes. Okay. Not at all essential to the, to the, uh, the sacrament itself. Right, but again, but it's, it's beautiful. But it is, it is, and it's yeah. you know, it's it's the part of the the uh, ordination ceremony that all of us who have already been ordained look forward to. It's our big moment. We put on our stoles and yeah. come and impose our hands upon the the head of all these these new priests. Yeah. Um, and it's a it's it, it's a great reminder for all of us too of our of that moment for ourselves. Mm-hmm. And however many years ago when we we uh, we received that that um, consecration that that. Um, mark on our soul, uniting us in that special way to our Lord Jesus Christ. And then after this ceremony, there's the there's the recitation of the prayer, which is the form. And I think this is maybe the only time in the sacraments where the matter and the form are separated. So here, the the 
there are actually two two prayers intervening before I even get to the the preface that contains the form uh, that are not themselves the form. So the the bishop recites a prayer. Then there's a like Tom Mushenawa, uh, everyone genuflecting towards the towards the altar, uh, and then uh, after that he begins to to chant the preface, uh, during which occurs the the form of the sacrament, which is the the. Uh, Part of the form that says, We beseech thee, Almighty Father, invest these thy servants with the, dig- with the dignity of the priesthood. Do thou renew it in their hearts the spirit of holiness, that they may hold the office, the second as to importance, which they have received from thee, O Lord, and by the example of their lives point out a norm of conduct. So you still have a, a moral union between the matter and form, which is uh, often sufficient for, for validity. Say, if you, if you poured the water in baptism, and then said the words kind of right after it would probably be valid although the right calls for uh, the actual physical union say the words while you're pouring it uh, here there is that that separation uh, in in uh, in time but uh, but clearly still that that union between the two actions okay. and at that moment that the, those words are recited in in the preface each of those young men, maybe not so young men, who have uh, had their hands imposed upon them, becomes a, a priest. So the words are pronounced, each one at the same time, they're now all priests. So so they're priests at this moment, uh, but there are going to be other ceremonies that are going to come later right. to and like, give them the fullness of that power. Right. And, you know, in the same way, in, in baptism, you have, you know, the, the actual baptism takes place with just the the pouring of the water and the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. But there's much more to the ceremony than that. It's to, to emphasize in, in the minds of everyone, those receiving the sacraments, those witnessing that, even, even the priest uh, administering the sacrament, here the bishop administering the sacrament, uh, the full significance of, of what's taking place. So so really the imposition of hands and the pronunciation of those words, that, would, that makes the priest, and he has all the powers of the priesthood by... The priestly character that's been imparted, but there will be other ceremonies that will, uh, you know, emphasize one part or the other of of his of his priestly powers uh, as we you know continue with the with the rest of the mass, and uh, you know, while not sacramentally necessary, they're liturgically necessary for the um, for a greater understanding, greater appreciation uh, of of the mysteries taking place. So what happens after the form then, Father? What part of the ceremony are we at? The so the new priests, right, again, who are our priests at this moment, will be will be vested in in the priestly vestments. So each of them comes up before the the bishop will be seated uh, in front of the altar, and the the bishop, you know, assisted by his uh, by the, the deacon and the subdeacon of the mass, by the assistant priest, uh, by by the servers as well. They'll, they'll first change the position of the stole that the, the ordinator is wearing. So remember, as we mentioned, it, it's over the left shoulder uh, as a deacon wears it. And he separates it uh, on the right side and then puts it over both shoulders of the, the ordinand, crosses it as a priest wears it for mass, puts it through his cincture. And so he's at this point wearing the stole as a priest would wear it when he's going to say mass. And then he vests the, the new priest in the chasuble. So the chasuble has been, was, was handed off to, uh, to one side. And then after the stole has been taken care of, the, uh, the deacon will hand it to the, the deacon of the mass will hand the, the chasuble to the, the bishop who will then put it over the head uh, of, the, uh, of the new ordinance. So at that point, he'll be wearing the priestly vestments. Although in the... It will be hanging down in the front, but in the back, it will be tied up. It will be bound and not hanging freely, uh, as as it normally is when a when a priest says mass. Okay, and that's uh, um, symbolic of the the, you know, the him not having received, although he has again received the, the priestly character. We hasn't been through the whole ceremony of of all of the uh, representing all of the priestly powers. Um, after this, we have the the anointing of of the hands, which again is another ceremony. I, at first, I thought that was actually part of the the matter and the form, but it's not. No, 
Okay. So the, the, the bishop you know, he recites a prayer before this, and then he intones the Veni Creator, the hymn to the Holy Ghost uh, that's sung um, throughout the, the octave of Pentecost um, and on many other occasions, you know, the beginning of a retreat, things like that. Uh, and so while that's, that's, that hymn is being sung, and it'll be sung over and over again as many times as necessary, depending on the number of ordinands and how quickly the whole thing moves, the um, the candidate again comes up before the before the bishop, and he presents his hands open with the with the pinkies touching, and then the bishop draws a line from the the thumb of the right hand to the index finger of the left, and then from the uh, thumb of the left hand to the index finger of the right. Okay. Um, so putting a cross uh, on the the hand of the the uh, hands of the ordinate, and then he anoints the whole palms. Uh, of of each ordinan, saying, and he says, vouchsafe to consecrate and sanctify these hands by this unction and our blessing, that whatsoever they shall bless may be blessed, and whatsoever they shall consecrate be consecrated and sanctified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the, the ordinan closes his hands, steps to the side, and the assistant priest will tie a, a white cloth around his hands so that they're bound together. And of course, again, the priest is already received the, the the character of the priesthood once that, that form was pronounced. I mean, that's the essential holiness of the priesthood. But th- these hands uh, will touch and hold the, the Blessed Sacrament. Right? The, the Holy Sacrifice, we can say, will, will take place in those hands. The, the priest is, is holding the host in his hands when he pronounces the words of consecration. He's holding the chalice in those hands when he consecrates the the, the wine that's inside of, inside of it into the, the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So emphasizing again that that you know the, the holiness of, of what he handles. Uh, again emphasizing it for the for the faithful and that's why you you, you have um, in, in the liturgy, right, the priest's hands are, are kissed often, uh, and mm-hmm. why in some cultures it's it's customary to, to kiss the hands of the priest, not because it's his particular hand, but because in that hand, our Lord Jesus Christ comes down uh, right. again and again every day, and that hand distributes then the, the blessed sacrament to the the uh, to the faithful. So it's it's emphasizing that that extraordinary reality you know we we consecrate with with chrism as as we're doing here you know the uh sacred vessel so the chalice likewise is is consecrated and the altar is consecrated and and along the same lines you have that that consecration of the of the priest's hands right and this is not just a blessing it is again a consecration it's more solemn it's it's something is set aside set apart right um right after this then again there's this ceremony of of touching the chalice and the patent Right. The, uh, so what with the hands still bound, so after each of the, the ordinances had his hands anointed, he comes back up before the bishop. The bishop presents him with a, a chalice that has wine in it and a, a paten with a, with a host sitting on it on top of the, of the chalice. And the, the ordinance touches those with his, with his hands so that his his fingers are touching both the chalice and the patent at the same time. Okay. Uh, and while he's doing that, the, the bishop says, receive the power to offer sacrifice to God and to celebrate mass for the living as well as the dead in the name of the Lord. Again, he already has the power to, to, to say mass by that, uh, by the, the imposition of hands and the recitation of the form. But here we're, we're emphasizing the most important of his priestly roles. Okay, so no, that, that here, here is the, the you know, reminding everyone of the he he's been ordained to do this first and foremost right, to to offer the the holy sacrifice. And just as an illustration on you know the theology and the, and the understanding of the sacrament changing throughout time, uh, or at least parts of the ceremony changing throughout time. Um, I think you had mentioned this a couple of years ago when we talked, or maybe it was just last year, uh, that this was thought for some time to be part of the form, uh, but it's not. And right, it's part clarified of, fairly recently. Right. So the, the it was believed um, by many theologians, many good theologians, to that this formed a part 
at least a part. Some said this was the the matter and form of the sacrament, this prayer, this touching of the of the chalice and paten. Uh, and I, the reason I think they said that was because it, it very clearly expresses the primary role of the priest, which is to offer sacrifice. However, the, the difficulty there is it wasn't introduced until the ninth or 10th century. And it's certainly not universal in among all the rites. So it, it's, it's still believed that it, it may at one time have formed part of the, it may have been necessary for, for validity for a period of time anyway. Uh, and this is still something that's open for discussion, but then Pius XII in the 1940s said, whatever it may have been in the past, from now on, the, the matter and form are the imposition of hands and this part of the preface uh, exclusively. And so that's an illustration of the power that the church does have over the sacraments when the specific matter and form have not been uh, mandated by our Lord Jesus Christ himself as they are in baptism and the Holy Eucharist. So in the other sacraments, the church does have a degree of, of liberty in, in determining those things. Sure. Okay. Um, so this has all taken place before the offertory starts and it's mm -hmm. kind of easy to forget that we're still in the middle of mass at this point. Right. But we are. <laughs> yes. And uh, so, of course, the, the ordinance clean off their hands Bishop cleans off his, uh, and the the mass picks up where it left off. So they'll you'll you will have the the gospel, uh, of course, and then a creed if there's a creed, and and then the offertory, and the new priests are going to concelebrate this mass with the ordaining bishop, and this was for many, many centuries, the only concelebration that was done in the Latin church. So the, the, the priests just ordained are, are reciting the whole offertory canon and communion parts of the mass with the, uh, with the bishop. Okay. And, and they are, um, not, it's not like concelebration as, as it's practiced in the, in the Novus Ordo with everyone kind of standing around the altar and so on. But each of the, the ordinate has his, Ordinance has his place in the sanctuary. He's kneeling. He has a, a stand or a stool in front of him with a with a missal on it, and and he's reading along the uh, the parts of the mass. And each each of those um, those priests has an assistant priest for his ordination mass, who you know make sure he's in the right place. You know, there's a lot of. Uh, excitement a lot of you know he doesn't necessarily remember where he should be and so to have an experienced priest there at his side to point out you know, now now go here to turn the pages for him and so on um which is it's also just a very uh um nice part of the of the ceremony showing in that that unity of the priesthood the 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 older priests passing on to the to the younger um and each the 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 ordinance choose their their own assistant priest, uh, usually a, a, someone who's had it, played a uh, an important role in in their vocation. So spiritual directors or former teachers or former pastors. Um, sometimes, if they have an uncle or a brother who's a priest, he fills that role and, and so on. Um, and it's an it's it's an honor, I think, in in the mind of all of us that, that when when someone asks you to to be the uh, assistant priest at at a at his ordination and. And the whole mass then just just follows as normal, um, except that the the bishop says everything out loud, <laughs> so that the the ordinance can follow along, and they can okay. you know keep pace and, and and recite things together. So the even the parts of the mass that are ordinarily um, said sotto voce said said uh, very quietly will uh, will be said out loud. Um, and then at, at communion time, each of the ordinands receives communion uh, from the hands of the bishop. So then um, the mass com uh, is completed at this point, or it will have been completed at this point, right. uh, but still there's a few more things to get, to get done. Right. Uh, a few more of those, those priestly powers that yet need to be expressed. So you have, um, after the communion is finished and all, you have the, the chanting of the uh, certain responsories, particularly the one that, that is um, quoting our Lord, I will no longer call you servants, but friends, which is a, a beautiful reminder of this this intimacy that the the priest is called to with our lord jesus christ and in, in fulfilling the the duties of his office 
Uh, and then there's a profession of faith. So the ordinands all re- recite together the Apostles' Creed. And then there's the um, bestowing of the, the power to forgive sins. Again, they have the power already, but it's, it is, uh, it's brought out by this, this particular ceremony. So uh, the bishop began imposing hands on each one, saying, Receive the Holy Ghost. Whose sins thou shalt forgive, they are forgiven them. And whose sins thou shalt retain, they are retained. So again, directly quoting our Lord Jesus Christ. And then the, the chasuble in the, is unfolded and uh, allowed to hang freely in the back like we ordinarily see it at Mass. And the bishop says the words, May the Lord clothe thee with the robe of innocence. So at this point, all of the those main powers of the priest, particularly the uh, that of, of handling the, the Blessed Sacrament, of offering Mass and of forgiving sins, have been brought out uh, by the different ceremonies. So now the, uh, uh, that being complete, the, the, the chasuble is allowed to, uh, to hang in its, in its normal position. Following that, each of the, the ordinance promises obedience to the bishop, or if the ordaining bishop is not the, 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 the candidate's ordinary, he receives it on behalf of the, the ordinary of, of, that, of, that, uh, of the new priest's superior. Um, okay. It's also it's a fairly striking ceremony too. The you, yeah. each one by himself kneels in front of the bishop, and we get you know, some great pictures from ordination ceremonies of the bishop looking right into the eyes of the uh, of the the candidate and asking for this this promise of obedience, and the 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 new priest responds, "Promito, I promise." Uh, you know, a, a a solemn thing, certainly. Yes. So, in the case of the Society of Saint Pius the Tenth, um, I know the bishop is receiving. The, uh, the promise of obedience on behalf, but um, who who would you be? Say you were getting ordained tomorrow, Father. Who mm-hmm. would you be uh, promising obedience to in your case? To my superiors in the in the Society of Saint Pius X, so okay. to Father Pavlirani and his his successors. Okay, and then in the case Superior of uh, the Benedictines, because I know oftentimes the Benedictines are ordained in the SSPX seminaries. Would their obedience go to the abbot? Right. Okay. To their own superior, yes. Their own superior. Okay. Yep. And then the bishop gives the, the, the kiss of peace after that promise uh, of obedience. Okay. All right. And then we have just some, uh, again, just some final elements right at the very end. Um, what are those, Father? So there's an instruction from the bishop telling the, the new priest to learn from an experienced priest before they, they celebrate Mass. Uh, and again, this is... Uh, part of the ceremony that, that predates the, the seminary system. So it would be have been possible to have been ordained without really having any idea how to say Mass in the past. Not so much today, certainly not in the Society of St. Pius X. Uh, we all spend a lot of time our diaconate year learning how to say Mass, practicing saying Mass. We're tested on our Mass. We have, uh, you know, um, so we're watched by a priest who, who really nitpicks which is necessary you know but down to the down to the littlest details of the things that we're doing wrong so that we can correct them and and uh and just to say mass uh not just validly uh but really you know becomingly with all the um the perfection possible okay and then uh then there's the solemn blessing of the ordinance by the by the bishop he says, may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost descend upon you, that you may be blessed in the priestly order, and may offer up the sacrifice of propitiation for the sins and offenses of the people to Almighty God, to whom be honor and glory forever and ever. To which they answer, Amen. Amen. Um, and again, that's it. Calling out again that that primary function of the, the priest is his office of, of offering sacrifice. And then there's a, a final admonition to to live holy lives worthy of the of the dignity that they've received. Um, you know, the it's striking how often the the church returns to that and and reminds the ordinands of you know this is this is really serious. You are you are not meant to be a man like other men anymore. And if that's you know that's true for the various stages of the. Uh, uh, of holy orders of the you know the minor orders and even the clerical tonsure before that you're meant to be separated from the world but much more so as you you are now the 
the minister of, of the sacrament of the altar, the, the minister also of the, uh, of the sacrament of penance, that you are acting in the very person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not something to take lightly. That's not something that you should approach unworthily or even, you know, carelessly, unthinkingly. So the church, again, constantly reminding throughout the ceremony and something that, you know, we, that's why we go on retreat every year. And so that we have to be reminded of because it's just, it's easy to slip into your, to your rut. And even if you're not doing anything uh, terrible or, or scandalous or, mortally sinful to remind yourself that that's, that's not enough that you, you are, are meant to be holy. You're meant to follow our Lord Jesus Christ more, more closely than, uh, than the layman are in general. Sure. I mean, just like anything else in life, you do something every day, it's going to become routine. And yep. so there's always that pull back. Yeah. Our, our rector at the seminary, Father LaRue would tell us and your seminarians, he said, you know, the first time, that you you expose the blessed sacrament for for benediction your hand will be shaking because you'll be very aware of what you're doing it will be very new it will be very striking and then you after you've been a priest for you know, six months a year it, it's, it'll just be routine just throw it in the monstrance and and uh and get on with it um and it, it is it is necessary to, to to remind uh to remind ourselves and remind ourselves often of uh, of what we're doing and we see that that's really the spirit of the church throughout this this ceremony uh you know again the whole, validly the whole thing could be comp- accomplished in five minutes sure but she really wants to emphasize you know the the greatness of this of this sacrament you know the the other sacraments uh largely depend upon it so there would be no uh you know, the only two sacraments that are possible without the priesthood, baptism and marriage, and those would would lack their solemnity and lack the blessings that go along with them if it weren't for the priesthood. So this is it's, it's a big deal, and those who are are um, called to to participate in it uh, are meant to to take it very seriously and to to live lives that are as worthy as possible of that great dignity that they've received. Uh, after the admonition, there's something that I didn't realize happened, and that is. There's a penance. You got a penance, yeah. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah, for every every ordination. So, um, minor orders as well. There's a. It's usually reciting the penitential psalms, some penitential psalms with the prayers that follow it. Uh, for the subdiaconate and the diaconate, it's reciting the the nocturne of the day for matins. And for the priesthood, it's it's three masses that are uh, that are to be said um, for the. Uh, intentions given by by uh, by the bishop in, in the ceremony, um, and so that's you're meant to discharge those as 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 soon as you can. Sure. Okay. Uh, and then the last part of the ordination ceremony is again a striking, moving um, song uh, hymn. Right. Yeah. Some people say that's that's why they go to ordinations just for the Te Deum. They, uh, <laughs> uh, and it, it is um, it's a beautiful hymn. It's a very ancient hymn of Thanksgiving. Uh, this this hymn. Uh, praising God for His for His goodness for His for His glory that the church is always used on on solemn occasions um, when God is to be thanked for something you know even at the uh, you know victories in battle and, and things like that at certain times in history uh, Te Deums would be sung in, in in churches and here you know this the, the again the the greatness of the sacrament being brought out by the use of this hymn. Uh, up to the, the the major orders, it's it's not used. There are other, often we've seen the Magnificat as a hymn of thanksgiving for minor orders, but for the major orders, uh, to still, you know, more solemn this uh, this great hymn, the Te Deum, that um, is very uh, forceful and boisterous, yet yet dignified and beautiful, and and uh, and really really very stirring. Sure. Well, thank you for going through all that with us, Father. Um, I did have one quick question. It's not on the notes that, that we talked about beforehand. Uh, in a lot of the other sacraments, there are, in extreme cases, extraordinary cases, there can be another minister. Uh, for mm-hmm. holy orders, it is always only a bishop. Another priest cannot ordain another. Right, priest. right. Okay. You've had, you've had some theories, um, various theologians over the centuries, you know, again, coming to that question of, is it, is it a separate part of the sacrament or is it just the, the fullness of the priesthood that maybe a priest could with permission uh, but that's uh, never been accepted as 
and the church would not accept that uh, as valid. Okay. Well, Father, thank you. Can you give us a quick preview of what we're going to be looking at next time? So next time we're going to take a look at the the, the new rite of uh, uh, of ordination, which um, we've talked a little bit about last year when we talked about its validity. As we'll see, the 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 matter is is the same, and the form changed only very slightly, one word, uh, not significantly altering the meaning. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think some people more or less accuse me of being a liberal for suggesting that this, you know, no sort of right was, was is valid. How dare you? All right. Uh, but it's a question of matter and form for validity. And we're not saying that it's good. And what we're going right. to point out is, is, is just how impoverished, uh, the right is it, it's lost a lot of its, its beauty and significance. This, this drawing out of the, the, the dignity, the emphasizing of the, the necessity of holiness and so on, uh, it is effectively disappeared. Father, looking forward to it. Thank you so much for your time. My pleasure, Andrew.